One farmer said to another friend, I heard you ask the Lord for that good garden. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is, replied the man whose flourishing garden was his delight. Only I never pray for a good garden unless I have a hoe in my hand. I say, Lord, you send the sunshine and the rain and I'll keep down the weeds. I kind of love that idea. Do you guys have car keys on you by any chance? Maybe car keys. Do me a favor. This is a weird thing. Take out your car keys. Go ahead and take mine. I happen to leave mine in my other pair of pants. If I had them, I'd be dangling. Hold up your car keys a little bit. This isn't to show off that you have a car, but think about this. Now, I want you to take your car keys, and I want you to put them in front of you and turn them, and we're going to listen for a car. No? This is not going to work, is it? You have the keys, but unless they're in the vehicle that they match, you're not going anywhere. Faith is like that. You can put your keys away. Faith is like that. God has given us the key to this wonderful vehicle of faith. And yet, if we don't actually use the faith, we're not going to get anywhere in our Christian lives. So how do we partner with God? How does this whole Christian life work, actually work? It's not just a matter of holding a set of beliefs in your head that you admit are true. I was talking about this in the adult Sunday school class today. I went through Lutheran confirmation as a 13-year-old boy. And I admitted that all of the stuff I was taught in my Lutheran confirmation class was true. But because I had never actually trusted my heart to God, it was just knowledge that was stuck in my head. It was like the German classes I took when I was a little kid. Three years old, my parents thought it would be cool for me to learn German, and they couldn't remember enough of it, so they hauled me to Pacific Lutheran University, and I took German for toddlers. Uh, but, you know, unless I actually went someplace where German was spoken regularly, Regularly? Regularly. <laughs> Has this German delicatessen in Tacoma, Washington, which is still there, by the way, still makes amazing sandwiches. I didn't speak German at any other time. I didn't speak it with my family, so it kind of, it was in there, but wasn't used. This Lutheran theology was in there, but it wasn't used, so it didn't mean anything. And it wasn't until years later when I actually surrendered and gave my life to God and say, okay, God, you win. That all of that faith, all of the, sorry, not, not faith, all of the knowledge became useful to me in my faith. You gotta use faith. So how can we partner with God when he gives us what scripture says is useful for life, for godliness? What's our bit in that? I'm going to ask you if you would turn in your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And as you're turning to Hebrews chapter 11, page uh, 1874 of your pew Bible, uh, I just want to say that this is often referred, this particular chapter is often referred to like the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Faith. These people by faith have done amazing things. And to be blunt, as a preacher, it's a little challenging to preach through this because I don't want to beat us up with, well, look at what all these amazing people did. Let's rock you. Yeah. That's not where I want to go to at all. And so I was, as I was pouring over this this week, some things really jumped off the page that I want to share with you. Two things. Let's look at Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 5 to start us off. Now, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. 
By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he's dead. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Let's just put a pin right there. How do we partner with God? By building our base through faith. By building our base through faith. This is a foundational thing. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. That idea that there is bedrock of faith. And on it, we can build the rest of our lives. And the, the reason why I'm, I'm hitting that so hard is because as I was reading through this section... A verb jumped off the page at me, and I've talked with you about this before, that, that when I'm trying to read this and wrap my head around what the text is getting at, I look for unusual verbs, or words that I don't uh, get very often. And the word for faith in here is not unusual. It's a pretty simple translation, faith. But what really jumped off the page to me is when we're, when we're reading this in English, we see in the NIV it says, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, right? The word that's translated by, uh, sometimes it's, that's not in the text. The word here is the verb form of faith. If we were to translate, we, and we don't usually do that in English, but we could translate this faithing. Faithing, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Faithing, Abel offered uh, a sacrifice. Faithing, Enoch was taken. Faith is not a, a, just a thing that we hold on to and believe in our head. It's an activity in which we engage. There's something real and tangible and useful about it. You ever been hungry and go to your fridge and open the fridge and look for stuff that you don't know if it's in there or not, but you kind of hope it is? I don't know about you, but there would be times when we open the fridge and I look at it and the fridge is full of food, but there's nothing to eat. Because the fridge is full of components of things. Things that would work well with recipes. Oh, well, I've, I've got some ham, and there's eggs, and there's cheese, and uh, ooh, I've got chives. There is a potential omelet in the fridge, but there's not an actual omelet in the fridge. Why? I gotta cook it. I gotta haul the ham out and I gotta chop it up in little pieces and I gotta pull the eggs out and kind of beat them up a little bit, maybe a little bit of water or milk. That's an argument that Jamie and I have been having for 32 years. <laughs> what goes into the eggs to make the omelet right? You gotta grate the cheese. You gotta get it all ready and you know, you hopefully you do this all in advance so that by the time you actually throw the eggs in the pan, you don't throw the eggs in the pan and then start chopping stuff up, you're gonna burn eggs. You gotta get everything prepped, and then you assemble it all together, and when it slides onto the plate, we'll sprinkle of extra cheese on the top. Then you got not. Apparently, I'm hungry. <laughs> Faith is like that. It's something that we participate in, not just a static belief that we hold in our heads. When we see here in verse one, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. This is this this being sure idea. It's related to foundations. Faith itself has to do with what is at the bedrock of our lives. When everything else is shaken, what's left? Faith is this verb. Now notice in verse 4 as an example, faithing Abel offered a better sacrifice. Abel used faith as his reason for sacrifice and 
it was credited to him as righteousness like Abraham. Now, honestly, before when I would read in Genesis about Cain brought an offering and Abel brought an offering and Cain brought veggies and Abel brought meat and God liked the meat offering and not the veggies offering, I, I would honestly interpret that as Jesus likes burgers. Okay, so this is all about the barbecue and, you know, we lift up Abel because Abel has the meats, right? <coughs> But what if it's not about the substance of the offering at all? What if it's in faith Abel brought? But Cain brought his offering only in obligation with no actual faith. That puts a whole different spin on the difference between Cain's offering and Abel's offering. Because this is offered faithing in faith using faith as the reason for bringing the offering in the first place. That's a big deal. Verse 5, Enoch was taken. And I thought it was kind of interesting, by faith, Enoch was taken from his life. That word was taken means translated or transposed, changed. No. Like, for instance, um, the hymn, we are going to sing it after this is Be Thou My Vision. And in our hymnal, I'm looking at this, there are three flats in this. That means I gotta play this in E flat. I'm a guitarist, and playing anything in anything flat is unpleasant. I, I, so I, I'm just flat, not gonna play. I'm, I'm going to not play this in E flat. But I have a little gizmo that goes to the end of my guitar that's a capo, and I can put the capo in a certain place, and it automatically transposes the sound of the guitar. So I'm playing it in D, but we're all hearing it in E flat. Enoch was transposed for heaven. God did the transposing. Enoch didn't do it. Enoch didn't just look around his world and say, well, I'm sick of you people. I'm, sure I'm just going to live for heaven and God's going to take me home. No. What happens is that before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God, and that was by faith. Faithing, he lived his life in a way that made God smile so much that God said, I want him in the choir early. We're calling you up to the big leagues now. Let's go. He was transposed because he was faithing. He was using his faith to live. We build our base through faith. Let me ask you this. How would you use your faith in a way that would please God? Is there something that you could do and not just as a like a checkoff list, but is there something that, that you could incorporate into the ongoing use of your faith in a way that would make God say, oh, that's really good. It's time to come up to the big leagues if you're going to do that stuff. Is there anything? Think about that one. How can we partner with God? Well, not just by building our base through faith, although that is a big part of it, but recognize that we receive our rewards through faith. We receive our rewards through faith. We, we mentally put a pin at the end of verse 5, so let's pick it up at verse 6. I'm going to read 6 and 7, and then I'm going to jump down to 39 and 40. Verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir to the righteousness that comes by faith. And now, jumping to verse 39. These were, and these are all the people who were in verses 8 through 38. A big list. Verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, 
God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they, the people who were mentioned, would be made perfect. Jumping back to verse 6, rewards. Talking about rewards here. Without faith, it's impossible to plead God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. we got to understand something here. Rewards aren't about the receiving. We, we do receive rewards, but that's not why they're there. Rewards are about the giving. It, literally, it means that God becomes a rewarder. I haven't received a lot of sports trophies in my life. Um, exactly zero, I think, is the number. <laughs> because I've not engaged in sport uh, sufficiently to, to excel to where people on a team would see, wow, that guy's really good at that thing. I've, I've received a, I get a trophy for participating, not for participating, for, for doing something of note in our little theater group. But honestly, uh, rewards are expensive, so I only get to hold that in my house for a half a year, and then I have to bring it back. That's okay. I'm not doing what I'm doing so that I get the reward. I'm doing what I'm doing in, in a show because I love to do that. I love to be involved in the show. And my dedication to that gets recognized and rewarded. Our faith is like that. We don't live out the life of faith because, boy, oh boy, I want to wear a crown in glory someday. No. We live out our faith because Jesus calls us to himself. I want to be like Jesus. And someday I'll get rewarded for that. But the rewards aren't the point. Jesus is the point. Jesus rewards us with himself. Verse 7 here, by faith no one, when warned about things not seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. The in holy fear, he's, he's moved to build this, not because he's afraid of the rain that's coming down, but because God called and said, Noah, make a boat. And his response is, okay, God. It wasn't that God had a neat idea for a boat being built and needed some guy to just throw it together. No, if God wanted a boat, God would snap his hands and ta-da, poof, boat. Noah built it out of reverence, not fear. And here's the one that really kind of bent my noodle. The, the second half of verse 7. By faith, by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So I, I kind of had to unpack the word. Wait, 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 wait. Noah condemned the world. Does Noah have the ability to condemn the world? He's just a guy with a hammer. Bucket of pitch, whole lot of gopher wood. So he's not able to condemn the world. So why would scripture say that he condemned the world? So I figure there's probably a translation thing in it. What's going on? Condemn more like Noah judge the world as not worth his time compared to the importance of saving his family. Because Noah didn't receive this call from God and then turn around and say, ah, that sounds pretty good, but I know you can't flood the world until I get the boat made, so I'm just going to put it off as long as I possibly can, and uh, I'll wait for basic cable to get invented. That's not what Noah does at all. Noah realized that in comparison to what God had for him, the world wasn't worth his time. So when you look at it from that perspective, Noah condemned the world because he's busy building the ark. Because God said, build the ark. That makes sense? Noah isn't condemning the world because the world is terrible. I mean, no. Noah's busy 
doing what God has called him to do. He was becoming the heir of righteousness because he was faithing at the time. So, with all of this in mind, 39 and 40, you know, the reminder is that people of faith, and there's a huge list, and if you want to have a, an interesting half an hour, read the verses in chapter 11 that we didn't go over. Look at the Hall of Fame here. They might have received individual blessings, but these saints, these Old Testament saints that the writer of Hebrews is talking about, did not receive the goal of their salvation yet. They didn't receive it before they acted in faith. Instead, they stepped out in faith and then received the honors, the goal. You know, Jamie makes me a deal that I don't have to go to every basketball game or every football game that she's playing in the pet band with, but I got to go to some. So a couple weeks ago, she let me know I got two left. Which one are you showing up at? Okay, I'll show up. So Friday night, I was there. And, you know, when she first made this deal with me, and this was like eight years ago that we would occasionally go to the games, I'm just saying, I'm not a fan of basketball. <laughs> Watching it is kind of painful. But now that I've been doing it, not much, but a little bit over time, and I've gotten to know the kids who are playing, and now I'm emotionally invested a little bit. But in the game, because of the players. And I know that these players don't play the game to get the trophy. They play the game for the love of the game. And that eventually, whichever one prevails on the court, will get the win. But they don't play it just for the W. If they only wanted a W in a column, I could get a piece of paper and I could write columns and I could write a W and hand it and they go, okay, good. No, that's not it. Because they've got to get that in response to their engaging in the sport. Yeah? It is the same with our faith. We don't hold faith as a thing to have so that we get to be considered, I'm a good person because I'm a Christian. No. Not that it would be any of you, but let's be honest, we know lots of jerks who call themselves Christians. Just having the name Christian attached to the name doesn't automatically guarantee wonderful ethical behavior. There are times when I'm a jerk. It's usually when I'm driving and I'm on vacation. It's gotten to the point where we'll get in the car and Jamie has said to me, do you need to wear the clerical collar so that when you drive, you drive like Jesus would have you drive? Because I've seen you drive without it and it's not a good thing. The presence of faith does not automatically de me. I have to make that choice to live faithing, not just having faith. Verse 40, we'll wrap this up. God had something better planned for us, so that only together with us would they, the Old Testament saints, be made perfect. You see, the Old Testament saints trusted God to save them through faith, but they didn't know the name of the Redeemer. Job says, I know that someday, after I die, I'm going to stand on the earth with my Redeemer. But he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know how God's going to do that. We, through hindsight, can look back at the cross and say, Jesus is our Savior. And he's not just our Savior for the New Testament. Jesus is the Savior for all of the saints in the Old Testament as well. They just didn't know him by name. But they knew what he'd do. God will save us. Emmanuel, God with us. We have a name. Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in 
no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to humanity by which we must be saved. That's the partnership. God has given us everything we need for faith and godliness through Jesus. And that's not something we just mentally acknowledge and check off. Faithing. Faithing. We hold to Christ and partner with him as we move forward in our life of faith. Let's pray. Lord God, you draw us to yourself, and in so doing, hopefully we become more and more like Jesus. So Father, we, we, we try to live out your will, knowing that we fail because we're human and in a fallen world of sin, and look forward to someday when we can shuffle off this mortal coil and finally get it right. But in the meantime, we practice. We use our faith so that you can use us. We pray that you continue this building process in us. In Jesus' name. Amen.